Next in line is instrumentation error. This is the error which happens very often. Each one of us has felt this. The instruments are not working. There are leaking balls or the instrumentation has gone bad and you will probably get a bad spigma manometer out of all your luck. So this often happens. Okay, so that is instrumentation error. Again, something to note here. You see, your cuffs can either be large or they can be small. Say for example, you are working in the medicine ward and you want to take the blood pressure of a patient. Now, since all the spigma manometers in your ward are occupied, you ask the sister to take the cuff of the pediatrics ward and you come back, you take the blood pressure. What are the changes that you are born to observe? What you will observe is that the blood pressures of all your medicine ward patients are very very high. Why is this? This is because the cuff is falling short and therefore the blood pressures will be errorously high. Similarly, another day one of your friends from the pediatrics ward borrowed your adult cuff and took the blood pressure. What is bound to happen? Again, the same thing. He will have a low blood pressure reading for all the pediatric patients. So you have to remember the cuff should be adequate. When I say the cuff should be adequate, what do I mean exactly? That the cuff must encircle not only the arm once, but it must encircle the arm more than one third again. So I'll have to have a rotation around the arm of at least more than one third. To make it even more simpler for you, please look at the board now. I am encircling the cuff on the arm for one complete circle plus what I have done is I have not only circumferenced the arm but I have added one third of excess length of the cuff. Hence I am sure that the cuff is adequate and the blood pressure measurements will be right. So this is how we measure blood pressure and that covers our instrumentation errors. Going ahead, we have subject error. Classical examples of subject error you already know. Something called as white coat hypertension already discussed. You see the doctor, you remember your childhood. He used to give you a lot of injections, a lot of pain. So you are anxious seeing him. As soon as the doctor enters the office, your blood pressure shoots up and you have a problem with that. So when he takes your blood pressure, it is artificially false. When the nurse comes in, she is your friend. You liked her since childhood. She takes your blood pressure and says, Doctor, the blood pressure is fine. Doctor says, No, the blood pressure is high. So this variation that you have between blood pressure measurements of the same subject because of biological variations, not in the measurement, but in the subject is called as subject error. So that explains all the three kinds of errors you can have in blood pressure measurement. Moving on to the next slide. Now we deal with the prevention of hypertension. So we come to the main subject community medicine. Let's start making sense now. What are we as epidemiologists and as social scientists going to do about it? The first as you can see is primary prevention. Under the head of primary prevention we start with population strategy. Could you please recall what was population strategy? Very correct. Population strategy was a health scenario applicable to the population at large in which I need not be selective. The intervention can be applied to the whole of the population. So everybody is encompassed. Everybody can do it. I will get the maximum out of it. What is the population strategy for hypertension? The first point covered under population strategy is nutrition. We have already talked a lot about nutrition. Let's run through the points again. Reduction of salt intake, very very important. The times we talk about hypertension, salt will come. Salt has got a lot of direct as well as indirect effects on hypertension. It not only increases hypertension, but it also promotes atherosclerosis. Newer research suggests that salt also directly promotes atherosclerosis. We have a level that is written on the board as 5 grams per day. Where did this level come from? This level came from because we are living in India. India is a hot place to live. I sweat a lot and therefore I need more of electrolytes. These electrolytes come from salt. If I was an American or for that matter an European, the level of salt intake that is recommended for me is 3 grams per day. For Indians, for people living in hot climates, it's 5 grams per day. For people who are not subject to such temperatures, even 3 grams per day is good enough. So what I mean to say here is salt 
although it is essential for life the quantity required is very very small so you have to remember salt intake has to be drastically reduced how will you tell the patient about the salt intake will you tell him please take salt less than 5 grams per day obviously he is not going to understand he does not know what 5 grams means so how are you going to practically tell to the patient the practical application would be avoid table top salt what is table top salt when you go to the restaurant you put some salt on your curries and on your parathas avoid doing that avoid pickles india is a country which is famous for its spices pickles avoid pickles has lot of salt some other practical suggestions avoid poppadoms or puppets again very rich in salt so these are the food articles and these are the food habits you should avoid plus you can also avoid tinned and canned food because salt is a very cheap preservative and therefore tinned and canned food have a lot of salt so these are the practical advices that you can give to your patient rather than saying him that reduce your salt intake less than 5 grams per day which does not mean anything to him so this is the thing to do coming to the next point moderate fat intake we have already discussed the parameters i hope you remember energy contribution of fat should not be less more than 20 to 30% of the total energy intake and how much should the saturated fat contribute out of the total energy intake the saturated fats must not contribute more than 10% of the energy remember this is difficult to achieve if you remember your biochemistry i hope you know carbohydrates give less of energy fats give more of energy so target of less than 10% is very very strict practically you have to avoid saturated fats completely and the target will be achieved okay so that is the point here avoidance of high alcohol intake for that matter i would recommend avoid alcohol for all the reasons also for hypertension the saving grace for as far as hypertension is concerned alcohol does not seem to permanently elevate blood pressure what alcohol does is temporary increase and then the blood pressure comes down so alcohol is also a factor which can be avoided to control blood pressure restriction of energy intake obviously we saw central obesity was one of the very big risk factors for hypertension if central obesity is, has to be avoided energy intake has to be reduced weight reduction is a logical extension and exercise promotion which will also help in weight reduction and increasing your bmr so that the body continuously burns more energy and your weight automatically comes down next in line are behavioral changes what do you mean by behavioral changes we saw a lot of behaviors are associated with hypertension and therefore you will have to modify these also in order to have a holistic approach when do we go for behavior modifications i'll give you an example a patient comes to you his blood pressure is 200 by 100 would you recommend him behavioral modifications of course not a blood pressure which is very high behavioral modifications won't bring down the blood pressure very much what you are bound to do is try behavioral modifications in mild hypertension so that maybe you'll never ever need to start pharmacology for hypertension that is the step where you have to apply behavioral changes coming to the first change that you have you will have to have reduced stress and reduce smoking i'll recommend stop smoking definitely reduce stress type a personality people have specially to concentrate on this they'll have to adopt a more relaxed lifestyle they'll have to go down on the stress levels that they have so these are the modifications under reduce stress and smoking modification of lifestyle other modifications other life modifications which are conducive with a better blood pressure control salt intake professional stress other environmental factors these are covered under modification of lifestyle yoga and meditation have been proved out out of doubt to help patients of hypertension they also go a very long way for controlling health education our bread and butter definitely has to be done health education in hypertension is different from health education in smokers we discussed smokers know what are the side effects of smoking but they don't relent for hypertensives that is not the case the case is they simply don't know if you tell them they'll come to know and they are more likely to adopt a healthy lifestyle 
especially if you are practicing in india or you have ever done your internship in india you will come to know that indians are very much ignorant about the risk factors same is true for hypertension this is no ex- excuse next is self care with a logbook this is something again interesting because self care with a logbook can be done both in diabetes as well as hypertension what is interesting the interesting part is that the patient reduces the workload of the doctor so this is when the patient is helping you how can he help you at least the patient can measure his blood pressure by himself earlier this was not possible fortunately in today's day and age we have electronic spigomanometers we will at least measure the blood pressure for you and the patient can maintain a logbook so the next time he comes to the doctor's office he can have that logbook ready and the doctor can just have a look at the blood pressure readings so this is what we mean by self care and logbook maintenance the next strategy is high risk strategy high risk groups again try to remember what were the high risk groups for hypertension these would be population who are old population who smokes population who has family history of hypertension population who has been marked as hrg on the tracking we just saw tracking in the last class so population who has been year marked for monitoring by tracking so these are people who will fall under high risk strategy so what do we do we then apply secondary prevention what are the points covered in secondary prevention first and foremost early case reduction again a big dark area secondary prevention even if the doctor randomly takes blood pressure for everybody who is above 35 or 40 years of age believe me a lot of burden for hypertension will come into notice unfortunately this habit is completely lacking from india most of the patients who come to you may be hypertensive may be diabetic what do we do we simply do not run the tests so therefore a lot of case load is missed what you ought to do you ought to take blood pressures of most of the people who come to your office who are aged and believe me you take out a large chunk of the submerged portion of the iceberg these are sub clinical cases undiagnosed cases and you will be the first one to diagnose them so please do that screening therefore becomes essential and no screening is as easy as screening for hypertension we have got complicated tests for others even for diabetes you will have to do igt igt is glucose tolerance test but here do nothing just take blood pressure and your work is sorted so please do that screening is essential early case detection definitely helps coming to the treatment part one new development which is not on the slides which you should know from my pharmacology knowledge ace inhibitors the word in pharmacology now as inhibitors for hypertension as inhibitors for a lot of other cardiac diseases specialties they are the only group of drugs which can actually shrink the hypertrophic myometrium can you imagine a myometrium that has been hypertrophic because of blood pressure actually shrinks down as inhibitors also have been proved to induce neovascularization what is neovascularization it is the development of new blood vessels it's it's magical both things which i told you are magic neovascularization decrease in hypertrophy so ace inhibitors the class of drug you should know the aim definitely of the treatment is bringing the blood pressure below 140 by 90 ideally bring it as low as possible unless the patient is asymptomatic but a fair target would be 120 by 80 we are very happy if the patient maintains a blood pressure close to this level so that is what our treatment target should be 120 by 80 the classical hypertension definition or the blood pressure definition that all of us have in our heads patient compliance again special mention of patient compliance has been made here because hypertension as you know is not a curable disease hypertension is not the typical curable disease i can cure hypertension with a pill if you are hypertensive you are bound to be hypertensive for the rest of your life compliance is a major issue if you fall ill you can take medicines for 5 days 4 days but if i ask you to take pills for the rest of your life definitely a big issue please motivate the patient please talk to the patient 
have frequent visits of the patient and tell him easier drug medications if possible. All these steps are very essential for patient compliance. With that, we finish hypertension. I'll see you in the next class.